So it's almost like they're fighting an uphill battle. And so I was thinking beyond the, the individual small battles that we may be facing together or individually, what is some, what's a larger issue for me? And I really do think for me, from my seat, I see a lot of folks struggling with how to be resilient, how to cope with all these issues, how to overcome and how to think about those things and how do I move forward? And so many of our students nowadays, um, and this is just my opinion, and I've seen on my campus, some of our students who are just so brilliant, one thing happens and they completely fall apart. Mm. And we spend a lot of time trying to rebuild them and get them back to the state to get them continuing on their path. Hello, and welcome to Student Affairs Now, the online learning community for student affairs educators. I'm your host, Heather Shea. In today's episode, we're gonna delve more deeply into the question, who are college students today? A conversation that is often steeped with assumptions based on outdated notions. My panelists today will unpack multiple perspectives on college students from the vantage points of various stakeholders. What are students' needs? What challenges do they face? And what opportunities do institutions offer? Before I introduce my guests, I'm gonna share a bit more about our podcast and today's sponsors. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and learning community for thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We hope you'll find these conversations make a contribution to the field and are restorative to the profession. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays, and you can find us at studentaffairsnow.com, on YouTube, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Stylus. Visit styluspub.com and use the promo code SANOW for 30% off and free shipping. And today's episode is also sponsored by Simplicity. A true partner, Simplicity supports all aspects of student life with technology platforms that empower institutions to make data-driven decisions. Stay tuned to the end of the podcast for more information about each of our sponsors. As I mentioned, I'm your host, Heather Shea. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I am broadcasting from the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe, Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi peoples, also home to the campus of Michigan State University, which is where I work. MSU resides on land seated in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. So welcome to the four of you, my panelists for today. Uh, I'd love to have each of you introduce yourselves. Um, tell us a little bit of more about you. And I'm going to start with Julie Owen. Welcome, Julie. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie Owen. My pronouns are she, her. I am an associate professor of leadership studies in the School of Integrative Studies at George Mason University in Virginia. Um, I'm also affiliated with the higher ed program and women and gender studies. So happy to have you back or on a previous episode where we looked at women in leadership, um, a, a fabulous book for which I'm sure we'll link as our affiliated episode for today. Um, Willie, Willie Banks, welcome. Hi, Heather. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Willie Banks. I serve as the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs here at the University of California, Irvine, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. So happy to be on this panel with everyone and good to see you again. Great to see you as well. Um, Jamela Coase, welcome. So happy to have you on Student Affairs Now. Thank you. So excited to be here. Um, I'm Jamela Coase. I am the Director of Teacher Leadership at Mount Holyoke College in South Hadley, Massachusetts. And I am also a part-time assistant professor at the University of Georgia in the Department of, um, in the College of Family and Consumer <laughs> Science in the Department of, on the Institute in Human Development and Disability. That's a lot of departments and names and titles. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> well, welcome. It's great to have you here. Um, and Yancy Gulley, it's great to have you on the on the podcast. We're going to um, have you talk all about the book here, but please tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks for doing this episode. Um, I'm Yancy Gulley, he, him, his. Uh, I am an assistant professor and program director of the Higher Education Student Affairs Program here at Western Carolina. Um, I come to you from Two Sparrows Place um, in the Valley of We uh, in Cullowee, North Carolina, the ancestral homeland of the Cherokee people. Um, and so I, I bring you greetings from our beautiful Blue Ridges. Come visit when you can. Oh my gosh, it is a beautiful part of the country. Um, 
thank you so much for writing this great book, editing this great book, um, Yancy. We're going to stick with you for a moment. Um, the book is called uh, Multiple Perspectives on College Students. It was just released this past August. And I'd love to hear a little bit about how this book came to be. You know, how did bringing the idea of or multiple people from different backgrounds and stakeholder statuses together? So you included students, their parents, K-12 teachers, as well as college and university administrators. Tell us how you brought all those folks in to this project. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, I'll tell you, like, like most good ideas uh, that I have had in my life with my colleagues, it is an idea with a colleague. Um, many of you might know Dr. Laura Dean, um, who is a dear friend of mine. Um, she and I were at dinner one night at a wonderful Italian restaurant in Athens, Georgia. Um, she was having a glass of red wine. I was having a glass of whiskey. And we were talking about all the things we knew from our different backgrounds in our careers. If you know, um, Laura had come from small private institutions primarily, and then was working at the University of Georgia as faculty. I primarily worked at two-year colleges, both public and private um, around the country um, before working kind of at the, the larger institutions. And we're just having a conversation about how the students we worked with that day at UGA were so different from the people that we had worked with previously in our careers. And then we started having a conversation about why people's views of higher education were different from the different perspectives of those institutions, which led us to a conversation about well, wait, we know a state legislator who's really talking about higher education in a totally different way than any of the things we just mentioned. And it just kind of this just kind of epiphany happened of like, this is a conversation that we don't have in the field enough, mm. um, that, that there are people from other places and other locales other than these big research intensive four year institutions, um, which is where, how we situate higher education today um, is in this myopic view. And so that was really what, what started it. Um, and then having more and more of those conversations um, after that with different people. And so one day I just put my foot down and said, I want to remedy this, um, <laughs> this issue of not talking about it, or at least begin a conversation that I hope, hope can go on. And so I just started calling my friends and calling my friends who had friends uh, to get to folks representative of all the kinds of stakeholders. Um, and so that's how you would get to some of these folks here today, because what I realized, too, is that while I thought that stakeholder voices were important, and they certainly are, I thought having scholars be able to analyze what those conversations were would be useful, too. And so, you know, I had Julie come in and some other folks to kind of say, what is about these voices that is similar and what's about, different about them and what can they tell us um, in conversation? And so that's kind of how we got here. Um, and I, I could go on and on about the wonderful people who contributed, but uh, it, it was a typical, you know, reach out to friends, reach out to friends, reach out to friends, and then start begging people sometimes. I love it. Before we, um, before we hit record today, I think Julie said, how do you, how, what's the one degree of separation from you from Yancy Gilt, right? So it, it is a, it is a small world. And I love, I love how it within the book, it's a conversation. You know, it's we're having a conversation on a broader scale, but like within the book is that these stakeholder essays and then these um, these really brilliant analyses by by scholars. So um, I love it. I think it's fantastic. So when I think about this type of book, I mean, there's multiple audiences. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about how administrators, faculty, grad students might th use this text and what kinds of ways would you um, see this book showing up in either ProDevo or, or other kinds of forums? Yeah, that's a great question. We, you know, I really do see this book being used by a lot of people, I hope. I mean, that's my hope is that all the stakeholders who have something to say about higher education and have decision-making power about higher education, um, I hope they all look at this book because I think hearing other people's voices and, and seeing what they're thinking about higher education would be useful for them, right? Like I think the think tank leaders, um, they think about this all the time, but do they think about it from every perspective? Are they thinking about it from a high school student, right? It's perspective. They might not be. So I'm hoping those think tank leaders will use it maybe for a professional development with their firms and their agencies. I'm really hoping that high school guidance counselors use it to kind of figure out how to help guide high school students and their families um, in thinking about what's next if it's college. And mm -hmm. if it is college, what kind of institution or what kind of program might be available to them? 
um, beyond just uh, you know the view we have on you know, movies and television today. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think for the bigger primary audience, right? I think it's going to be grad students. I think in masters mm -hmm. and doc programs. You know, when when Laura and I were talking that night, we've talked about it since. You know, we teach a class on you know, the college student, right? Mm -hmm. Many of us teach a class on that or diversity in higher education. But are we talking about diversity of perspective about higher education, right? And so I see this book being really valuable, not just in one course, but in multiple courses. Um, and, you know, I've got some people who are already saying they're going to use it and have their first year grad students in the master's programs buy it and use it for the rest of the time in a program to be able to pull back to it as kind of a standard curriculum. So that's my hope is that all the people will take a look. I do think at the end of the day, it's going to be a lot of grad programs um, who, who utilize it which is really where I kind of narrowed the focus um, for Rutledge because they really wanted a narrow focus and so yeah. uh, did that for them. I love that. Well, I think, you know, we have a lot of grad students and faculty who listen to Student Affairs now, so hopefully this will be a good primer for you all as you think about what you might want to consider in terms of texts um, for fall or for next year or for next semester. <laughs> um, but I, I want to take a moment before I turn to the rest of um, our panelists today and, and talk just a bit about an activity that you have people pause and do. And so if folks are listening or watching today and you can pause the audio or video and, and complete this activity, even if it's just mentally, I think that might be an interesting way um, to kind of check your own uh, assumptions and biases and also the, the ways that you have constructed perspectives about college students. Um, so the activity is essentially, um, the book is based around five questions and I'll read them here in a moment. Um, but if you could kind of think about like, how would you respond? And then we'll go through and really focus on the last three questions, but um, kind of consider the ways in which we might have answered them if we were stakeholders invited to write um, a, a section for the book. So the questions are, who are today's college students? What are the needs of today's college students? What are the most significant challenges facing college students? What are the most significant opportunities for today's college students? And what can we do to best support today's college students? Um, so I don't know, Yancy, if you want to talk just for a second before I turn to the other folks around um, the origins of those questions, and then anything you'd like to share about the first two before we get into really digging into the the, the third, fourth, and fifth. Yeah. Um, you know, I really wanted to, we keep saying conversation, this book to be a conversation. I think conversations have flow, right? We want to start off with kind of some, some base layer information. And so who are today's college students? It seems like we should know the answer to that, right? But I think if you walked onto most college campuses today and went to an administrator or a faculty member and said, who are our college students? I bet in most cases, which has been my experience, that people answer that with not data driven facts about who their mm -hmm. college students are. They talk about who their aspirational college students are mm -hmm. or who the college student their institution is built for and designed for are, whether or not that's who actually attends their institution and earns degrees or not. Um, so I really wanted to start out there, which is why the first three chapters of this book really unpack a bit of that, right? The, we have early chapters where it's a whole about data. Who are the college students? Let's actually look and see who they are, right? Because we know that, you know, the minority of college students go to four-year institutions right out of high school, you know, so we want to unpack that. And then, then we thought about what are their needs, right? And I wanted to spend some time thinking about what do they need to be successful? Oh, and by the way, how we, do we need to define success? Mm. Um, and I thought those two questions really gave us a baseline to then be able to move beyond kind of a deficit model thinking, right? Mm. We do needs, we split the challenges, which also is, I think, you know, a bit different, right? Because needs are something they have to have, a challenge is something they need to overcome. Mm. Um, and how do we help them do that? And then really the last two turning to what we can do as stakeholders to, to be supportive of the future of higher education in general through support of our students. I love it. Well, Willie, let's turn to you. So you are a vice chancellor of student affairs at a massive institution. Um, from your perspective, what do you see as the most significant challenges facing college students today? 
Sure. And that's a great question. And, and I do have to say thank you to Yancey for giving me the opportunity to contribute. Um, he did bribe me and I'm still waiting <laughs> on my, my cake from North Carolina. So <laughs> I told him if I did this, I wanted some baked goods from his kitchen. Um, so I'm still waiting on those. But, you know, when when he asked me to do this, this was I mean, we were in the middle of the pandemic. I mean, we're mm. still in the pandemic. So let's oh, just, sure. uh, we're still in the middle of the pandemic. But when he asked me, it was almost like a year ago, Yancey, or a year and a half. I, I mean, it feels like forever ago. So in that state, you know, I was I was wrestling with how do I answer this question? Because I do think that our students face, a, a, there's a whole host of challenges for them. And what I, and I think when you read my essay, what you're going to find is I start talking about the college unaffordability piece, or is it maybe, in, you know, housing or food insecurity? Is it this or that? But I really, when I started thinking about it, I think one of the, the largest challenges is because around resiliency and coping. And I think really for, for me is that our college students face so many difficult and challenging um, situations. And so it's almost like they're fighting an uphill battle. And so I was thinking beyond the, the individual small battles that we may be facing together or individually, what is a, what's a larger issue for me? And I really do think for me, from my seat, I see a lot of folks struggling with how to be resilient, how to cope with all these issues, how to overcome and how to think about those things and how do I move forward? And so many of our students nowadays um, and this is just my opinion, and I've seen on my campus, some of our students who are just so brilliant, one thing happens and they completely fall apart. Mm. And we spend a lot of time trying to rebuild them and get them back to the state to get them continuing on their path. And so one of the things that I've continued to talk about with students and faculty, staff, families, is part of our responsibility within student affairs really is to not make it to be realistic with our students, but then hopefully give them the skills that they can overcome, they can be resilient, and that they can move forward. I always say that I hope that our students don't take one particular instance at an institution or in a class or in a residence hall, and that paints their entire picture of their mm -hmm. entire collegiate experience. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I see that far too often. You know, someone posted something from another student group, and I was offended, and now that is my cause is to get that group eradicated from campus. Mm -hmm. And and I feel like it's so much reactionary and not a lot of thinking about, okay, what can I learn from this? This is re this really, the situation is just bad, but what can I learn from, from it? But then also how can I move forward? And so that's really was for me was where I'm coming from with the resiliency and the coping is because I really want our students to, to face that. But I think there's some other things I didn't talk about that in my essay, but you have parents and families with their expectations and how they're swooping in, the helicopter, boat, lawnmower parents, all of those things contribute to how our students are able to cope or not to cope because um, so many things are handled, I think, by you know, their family or their, you know, advocates or, you know, their mm -hmm. therapists. I mean, it's so, it's very, every day is a very eye-opening day for me because there is a different situation. And um, so that's really, I'm going back to your question, Heather, for me, it's about resiliency and coping. I, I just feel like, and I would probably extend it beyond our college students. I don't know that people in general, I mean, but let's just be yeah. honest. Yeah. I wrote this pre, you know, this was before the Dobbs decision. This was before a lot of more stuff. I mean, climate change. I mean, there's just, I mean, let's just say the entire planet, our entire population, we're dealing with a lot of stuff all the time. And the constant feeding and the bombardment of news and information can be really overwhelming. And so I do understand why people really struggle with coping and how do you be resilient? So that's really where I'm coming from with my, my response. I really appreciate it. I just spent half a day last week in a trauma exposure response, you know, training program to try to help other administrators, because I, I do think we're, we're living in a time of just continual uh, trauma that everybody's experiencing, but it is sometimes like what's in your sphere of control and what can you actually do to, to kind of move in and through, and then how do we have all of that be informed through an equity um, lens as well. Uh, what would other folks say based on this college students you interface with? Um, what are some other challenges that have come up um, in your course of the day to day? 
So for me, I think when I think about who the college student is today, I think about the various contexts in which they reside. So mm-hmm. I teach at the um, I teach at the University of Georgia, and at the University of Georgia, I teach undergraduate students. So typically, those are students who are in their maybe sophomore or junior year. So they they are sort of newer to the college environment. At Mount Holyoke, I teach graduate students. So those are um, professionals who have been in their career and they have been experiencing the world in the field of study that they want to do. So they have a very different um, orientation to their work. What I see though in both arenas, particularly in undergraduate, um, is that they want the knowledge that they have not been able to get up until the point, up until that point. Um, so when really when you talk about um, parents swooping in and sort of hovering mm-hmm. over their children and Yancy, when you talk about um, what sort of what students are learning or what they what they what they want to learn or like what's right for them, um, what I'm finding is that for undergraduate students, they want the knowledge that is currently in some of our legislation being barred from them. So um, Mm -hmm. we know that there are states who are talking about not teaching certain critical issues. Um, And that's gonna leave a gap for many of the students who go to college for that knowledge. Um, Particularly, I teach in disability studies at the University of Georgia. So that is sort of a topic that has a lot of um, equity sort of um, foundations. And um, we talk a lot about intersectionality and we talk about um, historical context and all of those things. And for my students, it is sort of a bewitching experience, right? They think about like the world is now open to them in a way that it has not been before. Um, and they that's sort of the knowledge that they want. And they're trying to figure out like, what do I do with all of this new learning that I now have? Um, so I think when I'm thinking about like what who those college students are, they are curious people. They are people who want to learn and want to do something different that has been done. And then for the graduate students, I'm thinking about, um, they have been sitting particularly in education, in classrooms. And we know that over the last few years of this pandemic, we have seen, we've seen the effects on education particularly, right? And like really when you talked also about um, how students are not as resilient as they once were, or like they're having trouble, like figuring figuring all of those things out that's happening also in our K-12 classrooms. So teachers are sitting in that and they are realizing all of the rife inequities that have been up until this point. And they're like, now I need to do something different. Um, and that is both a challenge and something, and I, it's something that they see as an opportunity, um, but they're they're still struggling through like where is the right place for them to interject to make that change. So um, I think our college students are they are evolving and they are seeing the world very differently. And I hope that we just continue that momentum to get them to open their eyes to experiences and things that they may not have noticed before. It, but Jamila, I think that goes on to like. I think there are those students, right, that, that really want to push us and, and, and be pushed. There's another batch of students for which the challenge is they don't want to be challenged and they don't know how to mm. be challenged, mm. right? Because you challenge them and then you lo- they lose all respect for you if you disagree with them or present something that is not of their way of thinking or that is outside of their worldview. And so I, I also see, given the polarization in our country and frankly our world, right, that we are also seeing that with our students with ideas sometimes. So I think we, I think almost see the, the two ends of it, right? That let's challenge me. I want to be pushed. I want to go to these places. I want to push you. Oh, no, you said something I disagree with. You're a horrible, bad person, right? Like your idea is not bad. Your soul is rotten. Like, and so mm-hmm. I think there's an issue there too with being a challenge being challenged. Absolutely. And I'm okay with getting those terrible evaluations because they exist, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I know that I'm doing right by society. So I just keep trying right. for Like, right. let's keep it moving. Yeah, Yancy, you make me think I start all my classes before they even come in the door. They have to read Meg Wheatley's short essay called Willing to be Disturbed. Mm. Um, it's an awesome short reading. Um, but just sort of like, you know, our job is, at, at colleges is to make you uncomfortable a little bit um, because we know if there's too much support, you don't grow and change. So um, I, I like where you're going with that. And I just want to echo both Willie and Jamila. Some of this, I think, is people craving meaning and purpose. Um, and like we, I just see a, I see a crisis of loneliness in some ways and the mm-hmm. that I see in my classes are cool. craving connection. And then yet we get to those places where there's this big cancel culture. So, you know, I like yeah. some of the writing that's starting to happen about moving from a cancel culture to a connection culture or a culture of caring and connection. Um, 
So I like to just ask students what they think about that. And then all of a sudden, you know, three hours have gone by, my class is over. <laughs> they have so much to say about why, you know, it's hard to have authentic relationships and it's hard to sort of figure out what our purpose is in the world um, when things are so uncertain. So I think it ties into all the points you are making. Julie, we got to add that to our show notes for today because I think everybody's probably listening is like, oh, what is that? You know, I need to share this with my students. And my, I'm sure my I didn't think it up. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> I love it. That sounds great. That sounds great. So Jamila, as um, a former teacher and somebody who works directly with K-12 educators um, and a, as a faculty member, um, can you talk a little bit about the opportunities facing college students um, and, and kind of some of the things that you wrote about in your chapter? Sure. So um, some of the greatest opportunities that I see with college students that I think just haven't been there um, for a long time are the, the opportunities to actually affect change, whether it is big or small. Um, and I see a lot more service learning classes, which I love, like get out there and go do the thing that we've been talking about in here. Um, and there's an opportunity to not only do that um, by actually being in the place, but um, Paul, during this last period of, of two years where we have figured out how to use technology in more meaningful ways, I think that outreach can be different for college students and they can do more um, through um, digital means, which hopefully means that they reach a lot more students. Um, I think that the opportunities that they have just in the college setting and outside of the college setting is to engage with people that they might not otherwise engage with. Um, I think that that is always uh, something that my students come away with. They, uh, when they have the disability studies course in particular, part of it is to, go out and see what disability looks like in the world, um, be able to observe it, be able to interact with people with disabilities, because a lot of my students come to me and they have never mm. actually interacted with people with disabilities. And it is so fascinating to me. I'm like, what, what's happening? <laughs> um, what's happening in our K-12 schools that is allowing this? Um, but I think that college, if, if, if they are not getting it in their um, K-12 experience, then college is a place that they need to get that. Like they need to be able to um, see the world differently and interact with people who are not, um, who are different than they are, who have a different life experience. Because I just think that just makes them more aware and like just better humans, right? Um, I think another thing that they, they, that another opportunity for college students is for them to, um, craft what society can be. Um, so part of our role as educators is to facilitate learning, right? Like we tell them all of the things and we give them all the information, we give you all of the books. And then we're like, all right, now use it all and think. Because this isn't all, right? Like we can't stop here. I need you to think about what I've given you and how can we make this better? How can we evolve it? Um, and that's always the challenge that I give my students. Like here's, here's what we have now. But it doesn't have to be this thing because this thing right now, like this is not good enough, right? How can we evolve it? So I think that um, another opportunity for college students is to think about how do they evolve our society? How do they evolve toward a more equitable um, and justice oriented society after they've received all of these tools that we've um, given them? That was really beautifully said. And I feel like that should be the mission of our institute, right? Okay. Like here's all of this knowledge but you, what do you make of it and what do you do with it? And how can we, you know, kind of think about challenges and wicked challenges in different ways? Mm -hmm. um, Julie, Yancey, Willie, what, what else would you say are, are opportunities that you have experienced or what are some of the things that um, are facing college students you think are positive? I just want to chime on, mine actually goes really well with what Jamela was just saying, which is Actually, I feel like my students are teaching me about social justice and inclusion and what that looks like. So I feel like they're creating something that I aspire to. Um, so I think they are doing it. I just wanted to say that. Um, I teach this class of 25 women in leadership and I have th at least three folks who are tra trans identified. And then more than that, like four or five others who are identified as gender non-binary. And it's not a thing for them. Like it's still a thing for me. I have all these yeah. questions, you know, and I want to <laughs> get in their business and, you know, they're just, cool. um, this is who I am. And they're so integrated and authentic in themselves that they don't need to talk about. Like, it's just, it's very interesting. I'm having to change the way I teach instead of sort of doubling down on identity conversations. Mm -hmm because they're showing up so fully formed that I'm learning from them. So I don't know, I just, I think Jamila, I think they're doing what you're, what you're saying they're doing. So I wanted to add that. 
I, I agree. And actually, Julie, to your point, one of the things that I think uh, probably like five or 10 years ago, I had to switch in my head is that this assumption, especially, I mean, I'm an out queer man. So I always find out, you know, oh, what's your coming out story? And I remember there was a certain point in time when I actually, some students and I was like, oh, what's your, and they would identify, oh, da, da, da. I was like, oh, what's your coming out story? They were like, what are you talking about? And I was like, you don't have a coming out story? I was just like, what you, and they were like, what are you talking about? I was like, no, when you actually like had to tell people, they were like, no, I've just always been this way. What are you talking about a coming out story? And so for me, that's one of the things that I think is so, and in, in, it, it's unique and also just really in, empowering and also surprising mm -hmm. is that today's college students, the way they're showing up on our campuses are so different. I mean, and to Julie, I mean, to both of your points, it's very much they're coming here and they have expectations. They want to see change and they're not afraid to push it. And I think one of the things that I'm so proud of, especially being at Irvine, is that the type of students that we're enrolling are really high achieving, but then they also have all these other challenges. They're like first generation. They're from underrepresented minority groups. I mean, they still have all these other things, but they're thriving and they're actually doing very, very well. And so that's the other thing that I always want to tell people is that just because you're coming from certain groups doesn't mean that that's going to define your entire experience. And for a lot of our students here, they're doing phenomenal things. And I think that's the opportunity is that I think with technology, they really have their fingertips at a wealth of knowledge and information that for some of us on this call, we had to go to the library to search for it. You just couldn't pull it up on a phone and have all this information. So I do think the opportunity there is really where our students have so much information in front of, front of them that they can really almost chart their own path. But then also it pushes us as the institution the administration to really think about how do we adjust to meet those expectations? Because I think our students are coming with some very solid expectations of what they are expecting from their experience. And if we're not meeting it, they're gonna say something about it. I, I just have to share a funny story when you said that. I was like, okay, so that earlier today, I asked a student, do you want me to share my screen and I'll show you what I mean? And she's like, no, I'll just search it up on YouTube and watch it later and, and teach myself. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> oh, that made me laugh. But it's true. Like they they have completely different ways of learning in the world. And 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 whereas I would be like, okay, can you show me? I'm a visual person. I need to kind of walk it through. They're like, nope, uh, YouTube. I'll learn, I'll YouTube it. I'm like, oh, amazing. So when I think about college, and it, this is kind of a little bit off our script, but like when I think about opportunities facing college students. You know, do our institutions, are our institutions prepared to, to offer those opportunities, you know, and, and this gets into a little bit about like, what do we do to support, but like, how, how do we form and create the institutions in which those opportunities can be realized? So uh, I'll tell you, I, I, as Jamila was talking, and then as Julian and Willie were, were chiming in too, I was reminded of some research I've done in Jamila. I know you've been part of this, some stuff we've written about um, how activists um, mm -hmm. gain their strength um, and find their own resilience. Um, and it's often through doing the work, right? And I, I think I, I did a research study on LGBT uh, community college students, actually community college graduates, because I wanted to know what persistent strategies they used to make it through because the literature would have told us that, that LGBT folks in community colleges probably would not graduate. Um, and so I wanted to find out from folks who did how they did that. And it happened one of two ways. It was the students who came in already out to Willie's point, right? They were already there. They didn't need services. They didn't want to go to a club. They didn't want to see the poster on the wall. They didn't care. For the students who were going through their coming out, right, or their own understanding of self, they actually needed to be a part of the change of the institution. And so they actually, the ones I met with, if there was a club there, they always wanted to change it, or they wanted to fight against the administration, or they wanted to be the one to get a policy revoked or put in place um, around their identity. And it was that action of doing where their growth happened and gave them the strength to stay with the institution because they felt like they were impacting something that was worthwhile, um, not just for them, but for those who would come, come after. And so I think that you know, 
to this point, if we get out of their way, right? If mm -hmm. we if we give them the tools to 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 lead the way, we give them some information literacy because they do have it at their fingertips, but they don't always know how to critically mm -hmm. examine it. Right. If if we do those kinds of things and then kind of step to the side, I think that's really an opportunity for us and for them. Um, and I think some institutional types have done this better than others, right? Nancy, I love that you brought up the nuance of the students who are sort of on the same journey and on the or a similar path that are experiencing sort of the same things, maybe in different respects, or they're having different identities and that, or they have similar identities, but they're experiencing it differently. Um, I think an, another opportunity when we talk about the opportunities um, for students is for them to find their people, right? Like to find their squad, find their group, find the people who not only they are already, like they are similar to, but to find to the people who they are so, sort of similarly adjacent to, right? Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. it's like, we sort of got something in common. Mm -hmm. Let's see what I can learn from you. Let's see what you can learn from me. And let's talk about like what we can make happen between us. Um, and that's one of the things that I love to do in my class. I'm like, I see you and you don't look like you're that far along yet. And I see you who like, I think I can get you if I can hook you up with the right person. Um, and I sort of put those people together and like watch like their evolution, like watch how they evolve together and learn together. Um, just a real quick story. Like I had a student last semester who I was sure was, so in our department, in our disability studies certificate, there's like four or five courses in the sequence. And um, you don't have to take the whole sequence, but if you take the sequence, you get a certificate. Um, and I had a student and I was like, he is, just going to be here for this class and that's okay because I'm gonna give you all I got right here in this class right <laughs> so um I was like and that's cool like sometimes that happens but most often like if I can get you in that first class they'll go on to the next class um but I was sure that the student was not going to do that a semester passed I didn't see him but in the following semester I saw him come back to finish the series of courses and it was because I, I I like to take credit for it. Like, like I said, like I did it, like, look, like he's still mm -hmm. interested in disability and still studying. Mm -hmm. But I know that it was probably more likely because of the students that he interacted mm. with and learned from. Um, and he just wanted to continue his learning um, based on that. So um, I think like being in community with other people who are close to or thinking about similar things um, and having similar or maybe even different experiences is important for students um, to continue their learning. I love that. I, I think about, I mean, you said them in separate things, but like the learning community model and like building opportunities for interdisciplinary le learning communities, you know, where there's, there's a, a loose tie, um, but not necessarily everybody's studying the exact same program and doing the exact same sequence, but like the, you know, we're going to look at this broader social issue, but through multiple vantage points, um, what do we, you know, that's a huge opportunity for learning and growth and informing our work. Um, I love it. That's so great. Um, Julie, so your chapter was an, one of the analyses uh, chapters, analysis chapters. So you were able to think about the different stakeholder essays and then kind of draw the themes across um, to think about the question, what can we do to support college students? So I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you wrote about and then um, hear responses as well. What can we do to support? Yeah, well, be careful when Nancy calls you because this was a hard task. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I had some amazing essays. Um, I had Vernon Wall from those, you know, um, SPA and other places. And so I had an association leader, I had a faculty member, and I had this uh, of some parents, which was fascinating to read a parent's perspective on college. Um, so again, if you haven't gotten the book, definitely dive in there. There's so much wisdom just in the individual stakeholders. Um, and, and then I had the student, uh, Talia, and Talia described um, really being discouraged from asking for help or needing extra time in a math class. And she described that many of the faculty were distant and distracted. Um, and what a heartbreaking narrative, right? To be, and so I'm like, how do you help Talia? Like when I was writing, I kept thinking like, what can we do for Talia? And it actually brought me back to good old Schlossberg, you know, um, and margin, ma mattering and marginality, you know, the old oldies and the goodies um, are still still relevant. Um, and especially when students are in those times of transition, and as Willie has said so well, we're, they're always in times of transition right now, there's so much facing them. So like, how do we make sure they feel like they matter? I think that was the most important part of what I ended up coming away with. Um, 
you know, if you know your Schlossberg, it's like students need attention. So they need to feel noticed. So do we even notice them? And some of that's even just social media stuff and putting them out there as, as knowers um, and having somebody who comes with expertise, um, importance, do they feel cared about? Um, Schlossberg writes about ego extension, the feeling that someone else cares about whether they succeed or fail. So that's interesting. It's not just that I succeed or fail, but you care if I'm not doing well in your class. You care if I stop uh, coming to my student organization. Um, I'm noticed, you know, and that ties into that, all those feelings of disconnection we're talking about. And then am I appreciated by others? So, um, you know, it makes me think of that old Gallup uh, Purdue index from a few years ago where it said having a faculty member who cares about them makes students two times, I think, as likely to um, have well-being much later in their life. I mean, that's amazing. So I think we need to get into the caring business as sort of the takeaway I want to have. I'm very curious what other people thought about what we can do to support students. Sorry, that was kind of a nerd answer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that's great. Anytime you can bring in mattering and, and marginality <laughs> as Schlossberg, I think that's appropriate yes. because I think so much of that is at the core because at the end of the day, I mean, at you know, people just want to know that they matter. Yeah. And um, I, I think that's pro probably one of the things that we have to work on. And, and Julie, I love, you know, your call as far as how do we do better around caring. I mean, I, I really do think sometimes, I mean, it, you can just... I mean, I, I don't want to blame everything on social media and I'm not, but I just think that, you know, there's so many things that are going on and you can just be a number, you know, and the thing is, is that if you peel back, especially if we take a look at some of the social media stuff, I think it's really a cry for some people. They just want to be, they just want to know that they matter. They just want to know that someone cares and that they're just putting it out there, hoping that someone is watching or listening and that can respond to. So it goes back to the mattering. And, and I do think it's so important that, our students need to feel like they matter and they want to know that they have a place and that, that someone cares for them. And that may be an extension of, you know, they're not getting that in other parts of their life. And so they're going to try to find it in some way. And I think that, you know, we have a perfect opportunity. Um, look at me going back to the opportunity, the opportunity mm. <laughs> to really show our students what does caring look like in an institution of higher education. And it may not be a parenting, mothering, fathering type of thing, mm. but it may be saying, have you considered this? You're doing really well in this class. Have you considered this as an option for you know, future study or career? I think that you know, our students would flourish more if we actually took the time out to actually ask them, how are you? What are you doing? How are your studies going? And it's not a perfunctory, just sort of, let me just check off the box and say, I talked to one student today. So I have you know, done my thing. Um, you know, People really wanna know that they matter and that they care. I love it. Well, I, I think that I'm going to go back to a challenge of this, though, right? Because I think that, yes, our students do need to know they matter. They need to be supportive. We need to care about them. And I think most people who come into this, this profession of higher education, right, whether it be on the student affairs side, academic affairs side, faculty side, whatever it be, we come because we care, right? But we're seeing right now the great resignation, right? Everyone's mm -hmm. leaving the field. Um, of higher education, faculty, student affairs, administrators, all alike. And it's because we are so far removed from the ability to spend our time caring mm. um, and showing our students that they matter because we're spending umpteen thousand hours filling out paperwork or serving on committees or you know, serving our associations, frankly. Like all this other stuff that takes us away from the reason we came into this and then when we get tired and exhausted and we get burned out, our field, our mm -hmm. administrations, our whoever tell us, if you cared, you just keep working hard because you, you, you came in this because you care. You didn't come here to make money. And I think it just burns people out. So I, I think that I think most of us want to do what we're talking about, but I think many folks in our higher education uh, field writ large feel just burned out from it. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes then that gets turned into these people don't care. Mm -hmm. um, so so it, the, the, the opportunity we have and the way we can support our students is to actually be supportive of, our, of ourselves as well in some respect. Um, so being kind to ourselves and being kind to our colleagues and one another, I think could go a long way. And I think that is being student focused 
but you know, put your mask on yourself in the airplane first. Right. Well, Yancy, that sounds like another episode. <laughs> <laughs> That's another whole other Pandora's box yeah. that you yeah. want to get into. Yeah. yeah. This may or may not be from all the faculty senate meetings I was in today. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I really do. I, I agree. I agree with everything that all of you have said, but I think this piece about how are we going to address burnout and compassion fatigue and also racial battle fatigue. And, and, and I think that when we're engaging with students who, um, you know, there is only so much you can give if you have nothing else, you know, if your cup is empty. So sustainability of our profession, I think is really going to be a fundamental question that we have to grapple with. And we have done an episode on this based <laughs> on the book. Um, but I do think like the extension isn't just about staff and, and the administrators, but it is about the trickle down effect that that has on our students and yep. what their needs are if they're not being met by the faculty and staff who are engaging with them. So or if we're not role modeling what that looks like to have boundaries right. and priorities um, to Yancy's point. Yeah, yep. right. I love it. Well, I so appreciate this book. And I think that there are so many kind of key important takeaways and it has me thinking and pondering and kind of questioning, okay, what, what does come next for our profession? Um, and so as we kind of typically do at the end of each of our episodes, we wrap up by asking a question to kind of summarize what you're pondering, questioning, um, troubling, thinking about, um, and then we would love if folks want to follow up with you, if you would mind sharing a way that people can connect with you, that would be great. Um, and Jamel, I'm going to start with you. What's your final thought for today? Oh my. All right. Um, let's see. Final thought. I love this conversation about care. Um, it just warms my K-12 soul. Like that is we always talk about like relationships and connecting. So I love like the like centering care for students and care for um, future professionals. So I love that. Um, I'm thinking about how to um, connect, continually connect students to other students who will um, sort of create their path so that they can create their own path. Um, because I think that they are, they have some ideas that we have yet to discover. Um, I am also thinking about uh, some resources that I've been uh, sort of connecting with lately is one called um, Leading Equity, just because I've just been laser focused on equity um, and social justice and like what are some concrete things we can do as well as sort of some um, bigger picture landscape things we can do like societal, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so those are just, those are some initial thoughts that I've been having uh, and just centering like the well being of like, thought and uh, self-care. So thank you for this conversation. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. If folks want to connect with you, how how can oh. they find you? Where can they find you? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, they can find me on Twitter at Jamela Coes, J-E-M-E-L-L-E-H-C-O-E-S. Um, and then by email, um, jcoes at UGA or jcoes at mountholyoke.edu. Either one. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Julie, what about you? Final thoughts and how folks can connect with you. Um, I, I've i been reading, I'm going to, I want everybody to read Nancy's book and I want to promise this other book. Have you all read Four Pivots? No. Um, it's called Reimagining. But I mean, hate the word pivot. I just, I you know. know I know. Really Reimagining <laughs> Justice, Reimagining Ourselves, Dr. Sean Ginn Wright. Um, so yeah, it's a good pivot. This is a good pivot. <laughs> But it's about changes we can make in ourselves to create more equity and inclusion. Um, and it has been mind blowing for me, but um, he has a whole section on be both a lens and a mirror. And so that's what I think I'm, I've been thinking about all day since I read that this morning about like this book that the Etsy edited is about the lenses, right? All the different lenses we can mm. take. And then we also, to the four questions you started with or the powerful reflection questions, we also need to do our own work and put that mirror back on ourselves and think about those questions of burnout and who are we and what gives us purpose and fulfillment. So I guess I'm leaving like, I'm going to be a lens and a mirror, gosh darn it. <laughs> so, um, and you can reach me at Julie underscore GMU or on Twitter or J O N four at GMU on email. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, we're going to cite that book as well in our, <laughs> in our show notes. I love it. Um, Willie, what are your final thoughts? 
Yeah, you know, a couple of final thoughts. One, I just have eternal um, gratitude to Yancey for asking me to, to be a part of this project. And I think that's just fantastic. So I'll hold that up and make sure that people see that. Please go get one. And I'm still waiting on my pound cake, Yancey. So I'm going to put that <laughs> plug in. Um, the other thing that I'm thinking of, I'm going I'm to uh, tr contribute this and really give tip my hat to Julie for this. But who doesn't love Schlossberg and some mattering and marginality? I think that so much. And so I actually, I was thinking, I was like, when you mentioned that, I was like, I need to pull out my articles on mar mattering and marginality, just because that for me, when I was in graduate school was such an important piece. Um, and I just think it's so important that we really do need to go back on to, to talk about that. But then also the culture of care. I just think that um, that's so important. So that's what I'm thinking about. And I also think that self-care is so important. I have for years have always said that our students are the first group of folks that you can't fake the funk with. And I always told my staff, they said, and I always said, listen, if you're not in the right mind and you interact with students, students will call you out on that because they pick up, you cannot fake the funk with students. They will pick up if you're unhappy, happy, sad, pissed off about something, someone. And the thing is, is that really informs a lot of my work, really trying to make sure that we're doing work with our staff to make sure that they're in a good place because sometimes they're not in a, not in a good place. And I know this conversation really focused on our students, but so much of the work that we're doing in colleges it's really our staff who are interfacing with them on the front lines. And so sometimes we have to make sure that we're working on building up our staff and making sure that they feel that they're connected and that they matter and that they're not marginalized. So that's what I'm taking away from this conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Willie. Can people find you at UCI's yes. website? Okay. Yes, uh, wlbanks at uci.edu and on Twitter, VCSA Willie Banks. Awesome, thank you so much. And Yancy, Last but not least, thank you for pulling together this amazing group of uh, folks for today's episode, as well as for the book. What are your final thoughts and how can people connect with you? Yeah, one, thank you for having us and, and giving us this platform to talk talk about this stuff and have this conversation. Again, the hope was with this text that it begins a conversation. It's certainly not the end of one. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I think I, I end with a couple of thoughts. One, kind of where we're really just left off, uh, and we talked about earlier a little bit, like we do have to take care of our faculty and our staff and our administrators, right? Because that, if we're not good, we can't provide good to the people. But part of that sometimes is I think we we can get burned out with higher education, right? Like we get tired sometimes and we get frustrated at that upper administrator who made this decision that we don't understand or why did that board of trustees member do X, Y, Z? And so I think one of the things we need to do um, and we have the opportunity to do through these conversations is really understand what motivates other people and what aspects of higher education are important to them, right? Is it is it the money? Is it the Department of Education policy driven? Is it the legislator who wants to increase the tax base, who thinks we need to educate more people to commodify their jobs, right? Like So figuring that out, I think an opportunity to understand those lenses we talked about. So I think that's one thing that uh, I think we as professionals can do. Uh, and, and then I think the other thing is, I do think we need to focus again on our students. We, we've we created these, I teach the history class, history of higher education is my hmm. favorite class I teach. Like it is, it is my favorite thing. Um, and you know, our institutions of higher education in the US today are the same institutions that we had in about 1910. We changed a whole lot from colonial colleges to 1910, and then we got stuck. And we really haven't reinvented the model in a big way since then. But our students have changed. Our world has changed. How people access education has changed. But we uphold mm -hmm. this old, antiquated, frankly, idea of how someone should engage in higher education. And we don't revisit who our students are. We don't revisit what they need. We don't revisit should our institutions change because we try to change our students to our institutions and not our institutions to our students. Or frankly, in a world today where we still have minoritized populations when it comes to higher education, not just our students, but those people who could be our students if we would allow mm -hmm. them to be. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful, Yancy, I just wanna say that. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Who could our students be? That's great, yeah. How can people connect with you, Yancy? Yeah, um, I, I have a Twitter. I, I don't tweet. 
Um, <laughs> so you could go with me there, but you're not going to find much. But uh, it is at Yancey Gully. Um, the, the best ways for me are our email, um, frankly. So nygully at wcu.edu. You can Google my website and stuff like that, too. Great. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I am so grateful for all of your time today for this conversation and for your contributions to the book. Um, also sending heartfelt appreciation to our dedicated behind the scenes producer, Nat Ambrosi. Thank you, Nat, for all the things you do to make us look and sound good. Um, if you are listening today and not already receiving our weekly newsletter, please do visit our website at studentaffairsnow.com and you can add your email to our MailChimp list and we send out one email per week on Wednesdays. Uh, while you're there, you can check out our archives. We are um, nearing our two-year anniversary as a podcast and over 100 episodes um, for you to pursue. So uh, love love to encourage you all to take a look. Uh, thanks again to the sponsors of today's episode who make a, a, our uh, podcast possible. Stylist is proud to be a sponsor of Student Affairs Podcast. Browse their Student Affairs Diversity Professional Development titles at stylistpub.com. You can use promo code SA now for 30% off all books plus free shipping. And you can find Stylus on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, all the different places at Stylus Pub. Simplicity is our other sponsor. They are the global leader in student services technology platforms with state-of-the-art technology that empowers institutions to make data-driven decisions specific to their goals. A true partner to the institution, Simplicity supports all aspects of student life, including, but not limited to, career services and development, student conduct and well-being, student success and accessibility services. To learn more, visit simplicity.com or connect with them on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. If you could please take a moment, visit our website, click on sponsors to hear more about them and the other organizations that sponsor our podcast. Again, I'm Heather Shea. Thanks to all of the folks who are listening, everybody watching, and uh, make it a great week, everyone. Mm -hmm.